Um, good morning. My name is Dana Asherman. Um, I see many familiar faces, but for those of you who don't know me, I'm from the University of Miami. So this was a relatively easy conference for me to get to. I just had to drive and fight the traffic getting out of Miami. So, and for any of you who've ever been there, you know what I mean. Um, so what I'd like to do today is, is um, cover as much as we can about lung disease and the relationship to myositis. Um, and what I thought I would do is start off the session by presenting a case in just a, a maybe 15 minutes or so of introductory remarks and then really leave the floor to you to ask questions and maybe guide the discussion. Um, so hopefully that this is something that turns out to be worthwhile for you. So. I'm going to present a case. Um, and for those of you uh, who came last year, I, I did change the case, so it's not completely the same. <laughs> I have to keep everybody awake. So this is a 43-year-old gentleman um, who I saw a couple of years ago. He was referred um, to me in rheumatology uh, for evaluation of possible autoimmune disease. He was known to have interstitial lung disease, so he was being referred from the pulmonologist. And his story was that he had developed, quote unquote, pneumonia uh, about five, five years prior to the time that I had seen him. But he didn't respond to antibiotics. And after several failed attempts to treat him with antibiotics, his diagnosis was revised to pulmonary fibrosis. Not idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, but just pulmonary fibrosis. And he was treated with prednisone for a, a year. And he actually got better, clinically, functionally, meaning his pulmonary function tests, and by CAT scan. So by all parameters, he seemed to be improving. Um, when he was first seen at the University of Miami, um, he had the following pulmonary evaluation. His pulmonary function test showed so-called restrictive disease. Uh, meaning that there was reduction in certain values. The FEC stands for force vital capacity, basically a reflection of how um, much air can be breathed, breathed out by the, the person undergoing the test. And I'm sure many of you have undergone this test. The total lung capacity was reduced. And then something called the diffusion capacity, which we pay a lot of attention to, uh, was also reduced. And that's simply. Um, a measure of how efficiently um, gas or oxygen can go from the lungs into the bloodstream. And then the CAT scan at that point, which I'll show you in a moment, showed what we call ground glass opacification. And that's a fancy term for describing sort of a hazy appearance, which we usually think indicates active inflammation as opposed to scar tissue or fibrosis. And there was no honeycombing, which is a, a marker of fibrosis. The antibodies, the, the blood work, I'll, I'll spare you all the details. But basically, what I had at the time that I saw the patient was simply a negative anti-nuclear antibody, which is a common marker we see in myositis and other autoimmune disorders. There was something called an SSA antibody or, or um, otherwise known as Rho or Rho52. And the JO1 antibody was negative. Okay. And this is what the, this individual's chest x-ray looked like. Um, I probably should have put a normal chest x-ray up just for comparison. But all the white haziness where it's dark shouldn't be there, except, of course, for the heart. I don't have a pointer. But all of this sort of white, fluffy haziness shouldn't be there. It should be dark. And you can't really, we can't really tell by looking at that whether that's infection or some other inflammatory process. Um, but nevertheless, it's widespread, which would be a little unusual for an infection for true pneumonia. And then the, the corresponding CAT scan 
Um, of course, there are many slices to this, this study, but I'm only showing you one. But again, um, I realize that you're not all radiologists, to, again, to know what the normal is. But some of these white areas here shouldn't be there. They should be dark. So it's indicative of some widespread process going on in the lungs that shouldn't be there. So that much we knew. And I'll, I'll just go through this quickly, but um, let me see here. When I took the history and, and sort of investigated a little bit further, um, there wasn't a whole lot else that, that, that this patient was complaining of. Um, didn't have any fevers, any night sweats, any weight loss, no constitutional symptoms. Um, no dry eyes or dry mouth, which is what those fancy words mean. No ray nodes or, or circulation disturbance. Um, really didn't report any skin rashes except for some darkening of the skin over the palms. And I'm going to show you a picture of the hands in a moment. Um, no cough. And actually, at the time that I saw him, wasn't complaining of any shortness of breath or what we call dyspnea. Was ha not having any difficulty swallowing. No reflux or heartburn, no joint pain, and no muscle weakness. Maybe a little bit of aching if I really pressed him, but, but no profound muscle weakness. So he certainly wasn't referred to us because he had myositis or was known to have myositis. On examination, the patient, um, he didn't have any fever, normal vital signs, normal blood pressure. Um, the lungs actually sounded remarkably good. Uh, on my examination, I didn't hear any extra sounds or any crackles or rows, no wheezing. He didn't have any evidence of inflammation of his joints, normal strength. And his skin, he didn't have any of the classic signs that we might associate with dermatomyositis. So he didn't have Gotrin's rash or papules, which for those of you who don't know what that is, those are sort of red skin rashes that can be flat or raised, and usually on the elbows or the knees or the hands. And that can be a telltale sign of dermatomyositis with which we might see an associated lung presentation. So I apologize for my photography. This is from a cell phone um, in the office. Um, if I had my kids with me, I would have done a much better job. <laughs> but I think most of you probably know what I'm talking about. That the, at least in their mind, I'm technologically very backwards. So what this is meant to show, and hopefully you can see this in the room, is that there's a little bit of darkening of the skin at the base of the fingers and the palms. But what this is really striking for is the cracking and the fissuring of the fingertips, which no one had really paid attention to, including the patient. And this is what we call mechanics hands. And this gentleman actually, as it turns out, um, did sort of do mechanical work, but this was not from his work. I mean, he, this was not typical of, of his hands. Um, it, this was definitely, you know, when I asked him about it, he finally sort of begrudgingly admitted that this was, he didn't know what was causing this, and this is not something that he had experienced before um, associated with his work. So, Really what we have then sort of as a summary, he had fairly stable lung disease. Um, remember, he had been treated for a year with, well, even more than that by the time I saw him, but he had been treated with prednisone, with steroids, was feeling pretty well. He didn't really think he had a problem. Um, and the only real abnormality on examination were these so-called mechanics hands. And the blood work was fairly unrevealing except for this SSA antibody. Um, and then th this is a little bit technical, but, um, and I actually borrowed this from another, another patient, but to illustrate the point. So the lab reports the ANA or anti-nuclear antibody is negative. But if you have a, um, someone who's paying attention in the lab, what they probably would have seen on this test, this anti-nuclear antibody, is that 
what the test basically is, um, is you take someone's blood or serum and you apply it to cells and you look under a microscope and you see if the, the, there are any antibodies in, in the blood or the serum that stay in the nucleus of the cell and that's how they get the word anti-nuclear antibody. So it was negative, but in fact, the fluorescence, because these antibodies are tagged with a fluorescent marker, stay in a different part of the cell, the cytoplasm, which is outside of the nucleus. And that technically is a negative ANA, but that does mean that there are, there's something in the patient's blood that's um, seeing something in another part of the cell. And that can actually be a clue, which I'll come back to later. Um, for antibodies like JO1 or related antibodies, where the, the, the target of the antibody in the cell is actually not in the nucleus, but it's in the area around the nucleus. And so um, I only bring this up actually because many laboratories these days do this test in a different way where they, would, they don't actually look under a microscope. So you, all this information would be missed if, if, in this case, if you use the newer methods. So I'm putting in a plug to do it the old-fashioned way. But basically, my diagnosis at that point was the antisynthetase syndrome without myositis. And this was based on the lung disease, the findings on the hands, which when they're there are very characteristic. And again, I'm sure some of you in the room know exactly what I mean. Um, and, and these sort of subtle blood test abnormalities. OK. So what I'd like to do, again, in the next few minutes, um, I want to leave most of the time for you, but just to, to review some basics about how the lung might be involved in myositis or related disorders, how we diagnose it, and how we manage lung disease. So when we talk about lung involvement in myositis, there are many ways in which the lung can be involved. It's, we tend to talk mostly about what I just presented to you, this so-called interstitial lung disease. And that's certainly the thing that we worry most about and probably the most common form of lung involvement. But that that really overlooks the fact that there are several other ways in which the lung might be affected in myositis. So, and, and just what I, interstitial lung disease, I consider an intrinsic problem with the lung. The lung tissue itself is, is the primary target there. But there are other maybe extrinsic causes of lung problems in, in myositis. So number one, the muscles that help to control breathing or respiration might be involved. So in many people, it's mostly arms, extremities, arms and legs. But certainly, there are muscles of breathing in the rib, rib cage. And those can be involved. And when they are, that makes it more difficult to breathe. And, and that can cause shortness of breath. In people who have difficulty swallowing, which can be due to muscle weakness. They're at risk of aspiration, or essentially choking on food or, or liquid, which when it gets into the lungs, causes a chemical inflammation, or pneumonitis, we call it. Because of the medications that we use and, and other factors, infection is always a concern. That can obviously produce shortness of breath, as well as abnormalities on an x-ray or a CAT scan. Heart failure, thankfully, is very rare in the setting of myositis. Or when it occurs, we usually look for other causes besides the myositis itself. And the other complication, which can be problematic, but again, fortunately, does not happen that often, is pulmonary artery hypertension. And this is basically not the same thing as general hyper, high blood pressure, but it's where the circulation between the heart and the lung is affected, the blood vessels are involved, and the pressure goes up. And that ultimately puts strain on the right side of the heart. And that's a, a feared complication, but one that we don't see that often. So 
Outside of the muscles, of course, the, the lung is probably um, one of the most frequently involved organs in myositis. Um, this is a conservative estimate that 30% of patients with myositis have some form of lung disease. If you look at it the other way around, though, if you, if you take everybody who has a diagnosis of interstitial lung disease and then say, how many of those have JO1 antibodies or a related antibody in the blood? Probably three quarters have one of these antibodies. So there's a very close relationship between anti-JO1 or, or other so-called anti-synthetase antibodies and lung disease. The other key point and, and something, key point really actually for the physicians that, are, that, that see patients with uh, myositis and lung disease is that the lung disease can occur without or before there's ever overt muscle disease, as in the case that I just presented to you. So it really requires um, what I would call an index of suspicion on the part of the physician. You have to be thinking about the possibility that something else is going on outside of the lung. And it's important to make this diagnosis because unfortunately, lung disease is one of the biggest problems, not only contributing to, to lower quality of life, but also unfortunately to mortality. So, um, you know, I, I always wonder whether I should put these statistics up in a, in a forum like this, but I believe in being straightforward. So the, the survival um, is lower in patients who have lung disease, at least certain types of lung disease. So maybe 70% survive with active lung disease after five years compared to a much higher survival rate in those who don't have lung disease but have myositis. But again, this is very much dependent on the subtype of, of lung disease. Not all ILD or interstitial lung disease is the same. So I certainly don't want everybody in this room to, to walk out of here if you have a diagnosis of interstitial lung disease thinking that you're necessarily in this category with lower survival rate. The, the other sort of vexing thing, again, from, from from my standpoint or from a treating physician's standpoint is that there isn't necessarily a correlation between the severity or activity of disease in the muscle or the skin or other organs and the lung disease. So we can't use what's going on in the muscle or other organs as a barometer of what's going on in the lungs. So what are the symptoms? you could probably tell me better than I could put on a slide. But it's, um, I, I keep using this word dyspnea, but which means shortness of breath, with or without a cough, which is usually not um, productive of, of phlegm, but there are exceptions to that. We usually don't see this phenomenon called clubbing of the digits that we might see in other forms of chronic lung disease. And clubbing, I don't have a picture, is sort of abnormal curvature of the, of the nail bed. And so many of you are used to being scrutinized at this point when you go into the physician's office. But as rheumatologists, we, we pay attention to details like this. And um, sometimes when it's the first time a patient has, been, has seen a rheumatologist, they, they wonder a little bit about our sanity as we start to examine fingernails and things like that. Um, the, the lining of the lung, the so-called pleura, is usually not involved in, in uh, myositis, so we don't see pleurisy or fluid around the lung, an effusion that we might see in another disorder like lupus. But the actual clinical symptoms or manifestations are, are quite variable in, in lung disease. So um, probably the most common presentations are the bottom two, either no symptoms at all. Sometimes we detect this incidentally. Um, we happen to be getting a scan of the abdomen for another reason. We catch the, the bottom of the lung and see that there's inflammation or even scarring that we didn't expect. Or 
a very chronic but slowly progressive course. It's unusual, again, fortunately, where we see this presentation, which um, a very acute fulminant um, inflammatory process in the lungs, which can progress to something we call ARDS, or acute respiratory distress syndrome. And hopefully, none of you have ever experienced that or will ever experience that. OK. So since that's not the usual presentation, how do we make the diagnosis of lung disease? Or how should we be making the, lung, the diagnosis of lung disease in the setting of myositis? Well, as I alluded to before, there has to be clinical suspicion. And again, what I mean by that is not all of you follow the textbook coming in with full-blown myositis and mechanics hands and arthritis and lung disease. We see, we're seeing more, or we're recognizing more and more that the lung can dominate the, the, the picture. So when we see people with lung disease and no, and no other obvious manifestations, we have to really ask questions and look. And, and so one of the things that we're doing at the University of Miami is, is we um, have a combined clinic in, in which I see patients at the same time with one of my pulmonary colleagues. So um, it's not exactly two for the price of one, because the billing people still bill for both of us. But um, we, we really are in the room at the same time. And I think the, the idea there is that um, we recognize that we can help each other in terms of, of um, you know, I, I've learned a lot of, of, about the lung in the last five years that I didn't know as a rheumatologist, and I hope that my colleague has um, come to appreciate some of the subtleties, like fingernails, um, in, in patients with these problems. But we have other objective tests, the imaging, the CAT scans, um, pulmonary function tests, where we can get objective measures of how well the lung is functioning. Um, we don't often do this process called bronchoalveolar lavage, which is where we, the, I don't do this, but the pulmonologist would look down with the scope and um, sample fluid from the lung. And, and usually when we do that, it's not to make the diagnosis of, of interstitial lung disease. It's really to rule out other processes that might complicate the picture, like infection. And then finally, biopsy. And then the question is, should we get a biopsy? And it's not always necessary. I think if we have the, the right clinical picture um, and we see characteristic abnormalities on the CAT scan, we can often forego the biopsy, which is good because it's an invasive process. Nobody wants to have a lung biopsy. But there are situations where it can prove helpful. So the other diagnostic tool that we use um, is our fancy blood tests. So I talked to you in the case about Joe on antibodies and ANA or anti-nuclear antibodies. Um, but we actually have a whole sort of universe of, of, of blood markers that we can look to that help us identify individuals with myositis or without my, overt myositis who are at risk of lung disease. Um, this slide actually is sort of the range of antibodies we might see in myositis in general. Um, but it's really mostly these antibodies here that are also associated with lung disease. And Joe one is the most prominent. But there are several related antibodies that we might see. And they're all named after people which is why you get this, these names like Joe 1, and there's a, a ZO, and a PL12, and a PL7. So um, I'm not sure that's the way that I would want to earn my, my fame, but is to have something named after me like that. But um, in any case, so if we look a little deeper, and, and I'm going to test you on this when we, when we leave the room. Um, but we, we see a whole range of antibodies, and here's Joe 1. Um, and 
the, the details don't necessarily matter for this purpose except to say that certain antibodies we know are more likely going to be associated with lung disease. So these markers in the blood can be quite helpful in terms of prognostically and really letting us know what we need to look out for, even if those symptoms or problems might not be present at the time that we're seeing a patient. So let me just say a few words more about the these so-called anti-synthetase antibodies. And I, again, I apologize, especially at this early hour for the, the, the medical lecture here. But um, I think it's important um, and an important feature of these diseases. So there's this whole range of, of funny named antibodies. Here's the ZO um, that go along with this so-called anti-synthetase syndrome. And the, way, the reason it's called synthetase is that there's an enzyme. We all have it in our body. It's, it's necessary for, to make protein in the body, and the, these so-called synthetases. Um, and they, they each code for a different component of proteins. And so Joe one's at the top of the list. It targets this particular synthetase we can call histidyl, tyranid synthetase. But here's the key thing that if you take all comers with myositis in general, this is the most common antibody marker we might see. Maybe 20 to 30 percent of all patients with myositis have this. And then within this more specialized category of the antisynthetase syndrome, we can see that if you, even if you add up all the other antisynthetase antibodies, the frequency of occurrence is much less than JO1. So that's the big one. But if we just test for JO1, we are going to miss um, some other cases of the antisynthetase syndrome. So what is this? Um, in its full-blown expression, it's really a, a, a combination of abnormalities or problems. So it's, it's myositis, usually but also fever, inflammatory joint problems or arthritis, so-called ray nodes, which is where the, the circulation, the blood vessels can go into spasm, usually triggered by cold. The mechanics hands, which I showed you a picture of, and here's another picture of what this can look like. And then the lung disease. Now, not everybody has all of these problems, or at least all of the problems at the same time, and as I mentioned before, this is, again, where these, these antibody markers can be helpful because some of the antibodies are associated with sin, uh, situations in which it's mostly lung and not so much muscle. Other antibodies in that category, you would see a combination. So the bottom line here um, is that this so-called antisynthetase syndrome is being increasingly recognized, not so much by rheumatologists, this is something that we're, we're used to looking for, but by pulmonologists, um, even in the absence of active myositis. And it really, again, I don't think I need to tell anybody in this room, but this is um, really something that's critical to, to, to appreciate and to be able to diagnose because, like many things, early recognition and management is, is key. So how do we manage um, lung disease? And again, in this case, I'm kind of being a little myopic and talking about the interstitial lung disease, but remembering that there are other forms of lung involvement. So even while we're treating the, the inflammation, the lung tissue itself, we, we have to be cognizant of other things that are going on that might contribute in a negative way to the lung disease. So we pay attention to these factors here. So reflux or heartburn, because again, if there's contents coming up from the stomach, even if you don't know it, they can end up in the lung. And that causes basically a chemical burn to the lung or a, a pneumonitis. And that can exacerbate the situation significantly. 
Although it's uncommon, we have to at least be aware that pulmonary artery hypertension may be a, a co-occurring problem. And then infection, always, always a concern. The, the immune system is, even without medications, is negatively affected in, dis in autoimmune diseases like myositis. If there is weakness of the respiratory musculature, that means that we, we all are supposed to use our muscles and, and a cough reflex to be able to clear things so that infection can't settle in the lungs. But when that's impaired, it's easier for infection to, to gain a foothold. And then if you layer on top of that all the medications that we use, which are designed to treat the inflammation but can also weaken the immune system, then there's significant risk. And so the medicines, that's probably a question that many of you have. You know, what, what do we have in our armamentarium in, in 2015 to treat interstitial lung disease? S steroids, corticosteroids, prednisone is still a mainstay of, of treatment. They work very well. They work very quickly, unfortunately, associated with many, many side effects. So the goal basically is even if we start off with prednisone, we typically add something else that's not a steroid so that we can A, better control the inflammation in the lung tissue and prevent progression of scarring, but B, have a backup so that we can taper the prednisone more rapidly and try and avoid some of these long-term side effects. The medications that we're using most frequently now, um, so-called anti-metabolites, which means they, they target the metabolism or the cell division of, of um, inflammatory cells. So MMF is Cellcept. Azathioprine is Imuran. Tacrolimus, you might know by the name of Prograf or FK506. Some of these medicines are, we actually stole from the transplant arena because they've been around for a long time. They're used to prevent organ re rejection in people who have undergone a, a, an organ transplant. And the reason they work in both situations is they target inflammation. In the case of a transplant, it's the body's immune system trying to fight off or, or attack a foreign organ. In the case of an autoimmune disease like myositis with lung involvement, it's the inflammation. It, it, these medications target the inflammation that's driving the process in the lungs. We're, we're using less cyclophosphamide or cytoxan these days, but it's still something to consider. It's a very, very potent immune suppressing medication. There's no question that there's risk of serious side effects, but if the lung disease is rapidly progressing, aggressive, or maybe not responding to initial attempts at treatment with these other medications, we'll use that, and usually orally, although it does come in an IV formulation. The real question, which is largely unanswered, is how, how do we use or how should we be using some of the so the newer biologic agents, these intravenous treatments or injections. Some of you, I'm sure, have heard of rituximab, um, particularly since there was this, the large trial in myositis seven, eight years ago. Um, this is a, actually a sort of a, an engineered antibody, not the same kind of antibody as Joe one but one that helps to target a specific component of the immune system. Um, that actually, there's, there's painfully little data to really back up some of the decisions we try and make, but there is an increasing amount of data suggesting that rituximab may be effective for interstitial lung disease, not only associated with myositis, but other autoimmune diseases as well. The TNF inhibitors we typically, and this would be like Enbrel or Humira, really some of the medications that we started using more than a decade ago for rheumatoid arthritis, they can be helpful for certain aspects of myositis, but typically not the lung disease. 
and actually typically not the muscle component either. Um, and I, I probably should have listed this differently because this is something that I would probably specifically not use in the setting of lung disease because there have been a number of reports actually in which the medications themselves have been linked to lung disease. So we worry a little bit about using TNF blockers in patients with myositis and lung disease. A big question which is um, maybe controversial is, is the wrong word, but um, I, I think an emotionally charged issue is the use of cell-based ther therapy, and I'm talking about stem cells. Um, and there are many, I, I don't really want to get into a discussion of stem cells here. Um, there are many subtypes of stem cells. Not all stem cells are the same. Um, I think some of you probably heard yesterday about different kinds of stem cells, whether they would work for muscle disease. There is some work that's being done, not specifically in myositis-associated lung disease, but other types of okay, um, lung disease, which um, has um, that, that is being sanctioned actually by the FDA. There's some trials, but not in myositis associated lung disease. So I think over the next five years, we'll learn more about that. Finally, um, the other things that are important to management apart from treating the lung disease itself is that we use certain antibiotics to prevent infections, what used to be called PCP, now PJP or pneumocystis. So some of you may be on an antibiotic several times a week. And then the last um, sort of part of the management is that we have to follow patients once we start a treatment plan, not only clinically symptoms, but we want to follow objective measures on the pulmonary function test, the so-called six-minute walk. We may or may not follow scans, CAT scans. And the other test, which I didn't really talk about, um, is periodically to get an echocardiogram or an ultrasound in the heart. And this is how we make sure that there isn't pulmonary artery hypertension. So what do we need in the future? And this is my last one or two slides. And then, as I said, the floor is yours. Um, what do we need to, to move this forward and make our, our treatment and our treatment approach better? I think that hopefully we'll see more and more of this kind of multidisciplinary approach where rheumatologists and pulmonologists and maybe radiologists are working together. We need to develop databases across institutions because these are fairly rare conditions. So it's very difficult in one center to have enough treatment experience to um, operate by rules of so-called evidence-based medicine. It's, we can't really do clinical trials in rare diseases like this. So we have to have standardized ways of collecting information and measuring response to treatments so that we can combine um, experiences from multiple centers. And that's, I think, the only way that we're going to learn more about and how to make rational decisions. Part of that process is not only collecting clinical data, but to collect biological material, blood, serum, cells, in some cases, lung tissue, um, so that we could do some of the scientific studies and some of the complicated molecular analysis and, and genetic studies so that we can define new targets for these diseases. But that's all predicated on this last concept. We have to talk to each other in the medical community. We have to be willing to share data and what we're learning so that we can put things together um, and make, make the right decisions, better decisions. So this is the last slide. Um, lung disease in the setting of myositis is common. You should know that there are multiple ways in which the lung can be involved not only interstitial lung disease, but other 
problems affecting the muscles. When we see patients, um, when we're seeing people with problems like the ones that you have, we as physicians have to really look hard outside of the lung for some of these clues that might lead to a diagnosis that has not yet been made. And to facilitate that process, we use our antibodies and imaging and maybe biopsy. The basis of treatment is usually prednisone and one of these other medicines. Um, and as I just said, uh, to advance the field forward, we really need to um, share data. All right, enough of hearing me lecture. So for those of you who are still awake, I would be um, happy to take questions. And I think what we're going to do is move the mic around. So please wait for the mic so that everybody else can hear your question. So the, the first question is, how frequently should we be screening people for sort of subclinical or occult lung disease using tools like pulmonary function tests? And there, there's no absolute rule for this. And, and here's where I think these antibody markers play an important role in guiding that process. So if I know somebody has Joe one or one of these other antibodies, I'll probably get pulmonary function tests every six months to a year, OK? I, I think, um, and if there's any change on these tests, then I might move to imaging to see if they're meaning a CAT scan. But even in, in patients who don't have one of these antibody markers, I think we, we have to be cognizant. And there, I, I might do, if there are no symptoms, maybe every one to two years, a little bit less. I think even long term because one of the points that I, I, I raised before is, is germane here because um, there's not always a correlation between the skin disease and the muscle disease and all these other features might be stable and, and I think you know, we always have to be on the lookout for, for lung disease. And it, you know, it, p having pulmonary function tests, I don't have to tell you, those of you who have had it done, not the most fun thing in the world, but it's also not the worst thing in the world. It's not really an invasive process, and it's, it's better than getting irradiated by getting a CAT scan every six months. Um, so the second part of the question, I think, was really more for you, and I'm not sure I exactly understood the, the, the question. I mean, I you said... So, oh, okay. so that is so. Um, if you have something like mechanics hands, even if you don't have Joe on antibody, I would predict that you have one of these other less common antibodies in the same family that aren't so easy to test for. So the way that I would think about it would be the same as with Joe one. So I would be very vigilant for lung disease, and I would say six months to a year for for pulmonary function tests. You indicated on uh, some of the earlier slides that there's, depending on the subtype of ILD, and I'm just not sure I what know that what that means. is unless they're the uh, antibodies. Good question. So, so what, what, what subtypes of interstitial lung disease? So this is, if we, if we do a biopsy, or sometimes we don't even need a biopsy looking in the scans, we can define different patterns, and, and there's, there's a whole lexicon or terminology, and it's based on the pathology, the way that the tissue would look under the microscope. But there's something called 
NSIP, which stands for nonspecific interstitial pneumonia, not really pneumonia. There's something called UIP, or usual interstitial pneumonia, and that's pulmonary fibrosis. Um, and then there's a few other types. So <clears throat> the, the, the NSIP subtype, the first one, tends to be more inflammation, less scarring, and that's usually more treatment responsive. So that might have a better prognosis. If you have something called UIP, usual interstitial pneumonia, doesn't mean that it can't be treated, but there's typically more scar tissue as well as inflammation. That's more difficult to treat. So that might have a somewhat less favorable prognosis. So when I'm talking about subtypes, I'm talking about it at the tissue level. Um, how the lung tissue is inflamed or scarred makes a difference. And also, really the stage, meaning are we catching this early when it's mostly inflammation, or are we catching it late when it's already scar tissue? Scar tissue or fibrosis is much harder to treat than active inflammation in the lung. But the, that's what I mean by subtype. So how would we know? Is it like on our PET scan? Or? No, so there's no blood test for this. It's really. Um, combination of appearance on a CAT scan, or the gold standard would be a biopsy of the lung tissue. But remember that the, while the biopsy can be helpful, we're getting a, a, a limited tissue sample. We, you know, we're not taking out a, a, lot, a lobe of the lung when we do a biopsy. So we're sampling a very small area, and there's always a risk that what you see under the microscope may not be reflective of what's going on. So that's another reason why we'd like to use the scans as a less invasive way of kind of characterizing the overall picture. Hi, um, my name's Susan, and I'm positive for Joe 1 and SSA. And I also have asthma. My pulmonary function test with my <laughs> asthma doctor is about 60%. <laughs> my rheumatologist doesn't really look at my lungs from an ILD standpoint. I've never had a CAT scan or anything. Is that, is that something I should have? Sounds like I should. Well, um, the short answer is, I mean, it's a little surprising to me, but I think it depends on the, what the pulmonary function tests show and whether the asthma component's really dominating more than what we call restrictive components. So it may be that your doctors feel that most of your pulmonary lung compromises do more to the asthma, which is really reactive airways that are going into spasm. And in that situation, it wouldn't necessarily be, you wouldn't necessarily need a CAT scan. So I, I think that's part of the, you know, without knowing the details, I'm speculating that might be why. But certainly I think if there's any consideration or concern that you might also have interstitial lung disease, that at some point, if nothing else is a baseline, probably should have a CAT scan without contrast. We had a question. Just like a, uh, I just want to share, like uh, two and a half years ago, uh, I was going through chemo, and uh, I was under the care of oncologist, and I developed the ARDS, and they were all puzzled how I developed because, of course, my symptoms was just a dry cough, constant dry cough. And uh, the constant dry cough, and they did a chest x-ray, and they turned to be negative. So we proceed with the chemo again. But two days later, I end up in the emergency room. Within the 24 hours, I was under the ventilator and for one week. And of course, there's a debate among the pulmonologists, oncologists, and everything until this year when I was diagnosed and they have an aha moment and said this has must, may have caused my ARDS. And how I survived it, they don't also know and they think it was just a steroid, bombarding me with the steroid is what kept my lungs to function again. Um, my question is how, how, how is so fast that I, I have a, 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 a X chest x-ray that's clear, and then two days later, I have a glassy chest x-ray, the entire. So, so the, the question is, how 
how is it possible that almost literally from one day to the next you can go from relatively mild changes on a, a chest X-ray and mild symptoms to ending up in the intensive care unit with this so-called acute respiratory distress syndrome? The short answer is we don't know, and that unfortunately is sometimes the story that we get, that someone has been sort of perking along, seemingly stable, even if they have known lung disease, and then all of a sudden, um, sort of colloquially, we, we say, fall off a cliff, basically. And we don't know, and unfortunately, we don't have blood markers yet that help us predict in advance who's at risk of that. But basically, what is happening when you go into acute respiratory distress syndrome is that your immune system has then become hyperactivated and the target is the lung. So all that white area, the, what we sometimes call white out on the x-ray or CAT scan are white blood cells that have flooded into the lungs. We don't know exactly what it is, what stimulates them to all of a sudden go into the lung tissue. And, but what you said, you know, fortunately for you, you, you had um, the best possible outcome given the situation. We, we use very high doses of steroids, um, you know, more than tenfold higher than you would be taking normally um, by mouth on a daily basis. And we're very, very aggressive. And, you know, sometimes we have good stories, but not always, unfortunately. Yeah. I wanted to clarify about the pulmonary function test. Is that the quick and dirty one where they just breathe in and out for two minutes or the 45 minute series you were talking about for lung function? I, I don't know that I heard the first part of the, the question, but I think I can still answer is that we really advocate full pulmonary function tests, which means not only the spirometry breathing, but getting in the box and, and, and measuring lung capacity. The, the, and um, ideally, we would also like to do the six-minute walk test, but that's not necessarily as essential. I noticed you didn't talk about IVIG, and the second part was um, that I just forgot. Okay, just the IVIG. All right. So um, I didn't intentionally leave leave IVIG off the list of medications, although I will say that, um, and, and for those of you who don't know, IVIG is intravenous immunoglobulin. Um, we, we use that to treat, at least as an adjunct, to treat s different aspects of myositis or skin disease and dermatomyositis. Um, that, that's not something we would consider first-line therapy for lung disease. That's not to say that it wouldn't work, but truthfully, that's not something that I think of before some of these other agents. Now, it, you know, we like IVIG. It's because it doesn't carry the same risk of immune suppression that some of these other medications. It's not that there's no, there's no medicine in the world, even IVIG, that's free of risk. So I don't mean to suggest that it's... If it were risk-free, I think we would try it more often. But it's, it's not really considered first line. Why that's the case, why it doesn't necessarily work as well, I, I don't know the answer to that. It's just based on experience, not only mine, but I mean, collectively, it's not something that, that we would think of for the lung disease part of it. Hi. Um, I understand that metatrexate can cause a fibrous lung. Um, would you go and talk to us a little bit about that? Sure. So um, we worry that some of the medicines that we would otherwise use quite commonly in myositis might actually contribute to lung disease. So methotrexate is a medicine. It's been around for years. We use it for rheumatoid arthritis, many other conditions. And <laughs> frankly, I. I we always worry about the, the, the medication causing various things in the lung, including an inflammatory reaction that might look like interstitial lung disease. If you did a biopsy, they're, they're not exactly the same, but we don't usually like to do a biopsy looking for methotrexate-induced lung disease. Um, the problem here is that that concern in many situations 
causes us to lean away from using methotrexate in myositis in certain people. And I'm not sure that's right because even though the drug can cause interstitial lung disease, it doesn't happen very often. And we have no data to suggest that someone with, let's say, Joe-1 positive myositis is more at risk of getting methotrexate-induced lung disease. So it's a dilemma. And fortunately, we have other options now where I think we can sidestep that issue. But the, the, re the short answer to your question is, yes, methotrexate can cause an inflammatory process in the lungs. But the second part of that is, that doesn't mean it's absolutely contraindicated. So I think we should still be using this medication, and we yeah, do. Is it reversible if we usually. Usually, um, again, like everything, there are subtypes of methotrexate associated lung disease, but most are, are ultimately reversible. Um, uh. Yeah, my question is, my wife was uh, diagnosed with Joe 1 in 2009, uh, was on salsa for about five years. It failed, was put on Prograf for a short time, and now is on IVIG. My question is, is the rotuxin, would that be, is that considered like a step therapy, or when is it really appropriate to kind of maybe consider that drug? And last question, what's the literature show as far as the, uh, the, effic the safety of it, I guess? Of rituximab? Uh -huh, rituxin, yeah. So I think that that would, that rituximab should at least be considered at this stage, given that you've been on other more conventional treatment approaches that have not worked or not been tolerated, let's say. Um, sometimes convincing the insurance companies of this is not so easy, but can be done. And the, the side effects basically associated with rituximab the main thing that we worry about is infection, because we're at least temporarily, well, for four to six months, we're downregulating this component of the immune system. But surprisingly, we don't see infection as often as we might with some of these other drugs. So although it's a concern, um, it's, it's not a huge problem. Um, I, I don't want to downplay it too much, but I, I think that we can usually accept those risks. There are some less, much less common side effects, which um, are very serious, but don't occur. So people worry about this process called um, PML, which is sort of multifocal leukoencephalopathy. It's a multiple sclerosis-like mm -hmm. problem. Um, and now there's a black box warning on rituximab because of some cases that occurred in lupus patients in particular who were receiving not many cases at all, fewer cases in, in myositis. Fortunately, I've never seen this personally in anyone that I've used rituximab in. It's something that I discuss with my patients in the interest of full disclosure. But, um, and I can't sit here and tell you not to worry about that, because if you're the one in 1,000 or 10,000 who gets it, it's not much consolation. But it's very rare. Because I had the lung biopsy, the, I had a lung wedge removed, and it was sent to Mayo, and they came back with boop, which is just, you know, we don't know what it is. And um, that was kind of discouraging, but I've also prophylactically was recommended to get the pentamidine, and I think that's helped me, you know, to breathe better and to not have infection. So um, just for everybody else, I mean, that pentamidine is one of those medicines we use prophylactically um, to prevent infection with this organism called pneumocystis. Um, we actually use that less often now because it's, if the, it's, it's not so simple to take it. It's much easier to take Bactrim or Dapsone, but if you have an allergy to sulfur, that's not an option. So technically, it's not interstitial lung disease. It's an airway disease. But it's definitely something that we see with, um, in the spectrum of myositis-associated lung disease. I mean, I don't, I don't, they're related, OK? Um, and 
Sometimes you can get bronchiectasis secondarily if you have inflammation of the lung tissue and it pulls the airways in a certain way. I mean, um, and, and then ultimately affects the functioning of the smaller airways that can lead to bronchiectasis, which for the few of you who are still here, um, is the, the architecture of the airways becomes distorted and the, the effectiveness of, of the clearance of phlegm and secretions becomes impaired. And so you can get infection, mucus plugs that are hard to clear. And it can be. I mean, it's manageable, but it, it can be serious. But the, the, we might not use this range of medications for bronchiectasis that we would use for other forms of interstitial lung disease. So the question is, um, is there any way that we, we can prevent respiratory compromise or failure? And there's nothing that we would recommend at this point in terms of medications to prevent that. Um, although, presumably, if you have known lung disease, you're on some baseline regimen at this point, which hopefully would prevent the reemergence of something serious that happened like what happened to you before. Um, but I, I, I think it's more awareness on the part of, of you as the patient and the physician and, and really to be on the lookout. And this is, again, the value of screening with the pulmonary function tests and other ways so that we, if, if lung disease is going to develop, that we intervene as early as possible. I also wanted to know, um, she was saying that one day she was doing fine and then a couple of days she was in ICU. Is that the typical way of lung disease? Is no. That, okay. Unfor I mean, fortunately, it's not the typical way. It's usually gradual? And, 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 and I don't want to leave the impression it usually does not culminate in this fulminant disease. It's not like everybody's on some inexorable course towards that. Um, and, and again, we don't know who's at risk of that particular complication when that's going to occur. Um, and it can occur, though, in people who've had seemingly more stable forms of kind of indolent, slowly progressive lung disease, or maybe even stable lung disease, and then all of a sudden it just happens and we don't know why. But it, it, that's, that's the exception rather than the rule. It's just that you know, when it happens, we remember it because it's dramatic. And I don't have to tell you that. Any other questions? All right. Thank you for sticking it out. <laughs>